Chapter 13 The neon sign at the fatal fedora was shimmering brightly and doing its thing. Tricks can be treats. It was blinking in yellow and burbling in purple. It's fun to be fooled. Oh, no, it isn't, I thought. I'd been tricked and treated to garbage since Saturday night. I'd been trapped in a funhouse where meaningless villains popped up in the hallways and stuck out their tongues and then popped down again, laughing like loons. There had to be sense in it somewhere, I thought, and maybe the trick was to start the thing over, go back to the get-go and see what I got. The questions were obvious. Who was the kitten? Who was he really? And why was he hot? The Beaumont Gallery was just as I left it. The smashed open window was still just as smashed, and I found Jean-Claude at the desk at the The smashed open window was still just as smashed, and I found Jean-Claude on the office desk chair, looking as perfectly groomed as before. He was snacking on kibble. Welcome, monsieur, he said, wiping his whiskers. A pleasure, indeed. I came to talk business, I said. We alone? He nodded agreement and gestured me into a seat on the table. Sebastian's luggage, I noted with interest, was gone from the floor. Monsieur Sebastian, he added, is gone. He left with his brother. His brother? Jacques, the gallery's owner. They left about nine. Without the kitten? Without a doubt. He pawed at his whiskers again. You tell me you come to talk business. But tell me, monsieur, are you here for Miss Budget? I can't really say. You mean you don't want to? I mean I don't know. Then your mind is still open? Let's say that it's empty. Let's say that it's screaming to get itself filled. I need information before I can hack it for either one of you. Start with the kid and with what makes him special. Ah, uh, oop, you've got time. It's a very long story, he murmured. Then start. Would you care for some catnip? I shook my head, no. That's a pity, monsieur. It's an excellent blend. He looked down at his kibble and took the last bite. This tale will amaze you, monsieur. And I say that knowing detectives are rarely amazed. A man of your background, a man of the world, has heard dozens of stories, but this one is true, which is why it's amazing. I nodded. Go on. And what, may I ask, do you know about Malta? I know it's an island, somewhere near Italy. Bravo, monsieur. You are smarter than most. My story begins on the island of Malta in 1520. I looked at the clock. Could we start a bit later? He shook his head no. I looked up at him quickly, but buttoned my lip. My family line is descended from Malta. The island itself had been conquered by Spain, but the king had returned it on one condition, that every year on the 4th of July, the people of Malta would send him a pair of their Maltese kittens, a boy and a girl. 
He gave up an island for two little kittens? They gave up the kittens for two little land. The kittens add value more, sir. They were known for their beauty and talent. The island had, what, a couple of palm trees and pieces of sand? He was growing indignant. I said, you've a point. Please go on with your story. He straightened his bow and leaned back on the cushion. The annual shipment of 1580, he said, rent astray. It was put on the ship, but through wicked fortune and evil intentions, it never arrived. The ship was attacked by a vicious pirate. He captured the galley and murdered the crew, but his destiny fought him, Monsieur. A storm like a raging tiger came up from the sea, and he couldn't defeat it. The ship went down. Down, down, monsieur, to the depths. But as destiny had it, the kittens survived? They floated to shore, monsieur, on the back of a bottle of bourbon and landed in France. This is fact, monsieur. You can look it up. It's in Kendallman's history of... Skip it. Go on. Nah, about that catnip, he said. Are you sure? I nodded my certainty. Still, help yourself. I watched as he sniffed from a calico bag and then straightened his bow again. Little is known, he continued contentedly, arching his spine. Little is known of the family's fortunes for many years until 1806, when two of its members arrived at the court of the Empress Josephine. May I assume that you've heard of the Empress? Napoleon's wife. But exactly, monsieur. There's a famous portrait of Mimi Labelle on the Empress's lap. Perhaps you have seen it. It hangs in the Louvre. I said, don't be silly. He said, very well, getting back to Napoleon. Hold it, I said. Can we cut to the present? I get the idea that your family is ancient. And royal, monsieur. We have royal blood in us. Contact with kings has invaded our blood and affected our genes. And Fluffer the kitten? His name is Louis. And what makes him special? The kitten is gold. I beg your pardon? He pawed through a folder and slid me a photo across the desk. An eight by eleven. A glazed still. It was a kitten. A kitten to make a robber kick a hole in a jeweler's window. Louis was golden, all right. The garishly gaudy gold of a sequin dress. His infant expression was much too mushy to give an impression of what he was like. He was still so tiny his eyes were closed. The caption beneath it said, Born yesterday, golden kitten named Louis d'Or, September 30th at Beaumont Farms. I narrowed my eyes and then looked at him sideways. Publicity gimmick, I snarled. It's a stunt. It's a stunt of nature, monsieur. The kitten is not made of metal, of course. He is fair, but it's fair with a glitter. It's fair with a shine. He is totally special, monsieur and is worth about two million dollars. I lifted my ears. He grinned at me briefly and sniffed some more herb. I see, I said carefully, not really seeing and not quite believing, but taking it in. So, how does Sebastian fit into the plot? I have no idea, monsieur. None at all. I wasn't aware he was back in the city till, 
what did you call him? The spatter arrived. You said back in the city. He lives in Wigan. In fact, Monsieur, he lives at the farm. He'd come for a visit and stayed for a week and then left to go home again. When did he leave? It was right after dinner, Monsieur. I would say about 7.30 on Friday night. And he'd taken his luggage? Indeed, Monsieur. I thought for a moment. All right, start again. So the next time you saw him was Saturday night when he lay on the carpet, Monsieur. As I've said, I looked to the clatter of Mr. Pata, who shot at Sebastian. And then? I left. I must have returned around two in the morning, and there was Sebastian, Monsieur, on the phone. He was saying to Algernon, Pops, I found Louis, but somebody died him. And then he said, No. Will you listen, Papa? They stole him again. And then Algernon's voice started screaming like thunder, You stupid idiot! Get to yourself home! But forgive me, Monsieur, he had screamed it in French, so it sounded more elegant. That's the whole thing? That's all I know of. And right after that, I went straight to your office. I gave it some thought. The whole thing was goofy, but then life itself is occasionally goofy. So how can you tell? I needed some backup. I needed some air. I rose from the table. There's two other things. A good-looking human with hair like a skunk. Have you ever seen him? He shook his head no. Can you tell me who G is? Eh? he said. G, you know, in my office. When Bridget was saying the kid in the treetop was someone from G. I paid no attention, monsieur. The woman is clearly a liar and maybe a thief. Which brings us full circle. For whom do you work? This red-headed liar, he offered. Or me. I looked at him squarely and said, I don't know.